Okay, so thank you for having me today. It is a real honor. What I want to do is spend uh, most of the talk talking about how Alstom wants to change the way we use technology in healthcare. Uh, if I have a few minutes at the end, I'll try and look at some of the broader themes uh, associated with sensing in healthcare. The goal of our company is to make a breathalyzer for disease. Uh, our goal is to change the way in which you detect serious disease and illness. Now, the way in which we're doing this is by looking at chemicals on breath, which are the characteristic markers of disease and illness. The technology we've developed is a microchip chemical sensor. Now, as you can see, it's small, low cost, but the key thing is it's analytically powerful. So what that means is in a matter of seconds, you can detect multiple chemicals, a part per billion, and even sometimes part per trillion concentrations. So this is the same as one drop of water in 20 Olympic-sized swimming pools. But the key thing is that you do this with a very low incidence of false alarms, which is what you need to make a truly useful diagnostic. Now, the key thing about the technology is that you can reprogram it in software. So you can take the same microchip, and if you want to detect a different chemical, all you do is change the software that sits on top of it. So we want to take this device and use this in a diagnostic context. Now, before I tell you more, I have a little bit of a confession. Uh, we are medical interlopers. So when I set the company up with my colleagues Dave and Andrew up here, uh, we weren't necessarily looking at healthcare medical diagnostics. Uh, we set the company up nine years ago, uh, right after 9-11, where there was a big drive to have better sensing technologies for military applications and homeland security applications where you're trying to detect improvised explosives and toxic gases. So over that period of time, we've raised $20 million of investment. We've built a bunch of products which normally are in green boxes, sitting on robots and those types of things. And we have a team of 45 people up in Cambridge. And a little while ago, I came across this wonderful term called the adjacent possible in Steve Johnson's book. And this is talking about with new technology and advances in new technology, how that can leak over into applications that you hadn't thought about. And that's what we're really interested in doing now, taking this proven technology and trying to see if we can make an impact in diagnostics. And I think the trend is generally true with sensors. You know, there's a lot of exciting stuff happening in aerospace, automotive, and inevitably this will leak out into healthcare and start to make differences there. My favorite example is accelerometers. So they were originally developed to help steer missiles. I'm sure about 50% of the people uh, in this room now have a, a Fitbit uh, activity monitor. So the notion of the adjacent possible is always there for technology, in particular healthcare. Now, why does detection matter? So I can give you the stats on early detection, but I'll give you a story instead. So this is my family, my wife Kate, and my uh, twin boys who disrupted my sleep patterns last night. Um, 18 months ago, Kate was taken into hospital with stomach pains. Uh, and 12 hours later, she had surgery on what turned out to be stage four colon cancer. Now, afterwards, uh, we found out about the statistics. Stage one, 90% of people survive. Stage four, 6% of people survive. So basically, early detection saves lives. This is why it matters. Can we use chemicals to detect disease? The idea actually goes back to the ancient Greeks. They used to smell the breath of patients as part of their diagnostic workup. A couple of times a year, you will often see stories about dogs who can detect illness from their owners. Uh, there was an example I got from Ward. I hope you don't mind me using the photo. This is me asking for permission now. <laughs> so a wonderful story of uh, this lady, Claire, and Daisy the Red Labrador. Uh, Daisy started to act uh, strangely, uh, behaving anxiously around Claire, uh, pawing at her. And Claire wondered what was happening. This behavior didn't go away from the dog. And after a couple of months, uh, Claire went to get a checkup. Uh, she then had a biopsy on what turned out to be breast cancer. But because it was caught early, they were able to do something about it. And this is genuinely true because your body metabolizes all the time. Uh, normal cells generate chemicals, which then evaporate into the air. Cancer cells, because of metabolism is slightly different, 
they generate different chemicals. So it's these different chemicals that we look for to try and diagnose. This is a wonderful example. This is McBain, the dog, over a pen vet. In each of these containers is a tissue sample. <coughs> McBain's very quick. When he gets to the tissue sample that is present with uh, ovarian cancer, he stops and immediately uh, gets that feedback there. <coughs> And dogs can do this with amazing accuracy. McBain is able to detect ovarian cancer with 90% accuracy. So this is fantastic in terms of demonstrating the proof of principle that it can be done. The challenge in a diagnostic setting is how you scale up that type of solution. So the era of modern breath testing started back in the 1970s. The great Linus Pauling. Uh, started to use mass spectrometers to look at breath, and he found these tiny concentrations of hundreds of different chemicals. So over the years, uh, this work has continued, and most recently, there's been an article in the Wall Street Journal where, using these markers, they can pick up everything from kidney and liver disease uh, to serious cancers. Now, I'm a little bit uh, of a skeptic. Uh, the engineer in me says, you know, it's one thing to have an article in the Wall Street Journal. I only believe technology stories and wired. Um, <laughs> so what is the actual underlying scientific evidence? That's actually pretty good. Here's a few examples. Volatile organic compounds of lung cancer. Point of care breath test for TB. Volatile biomarkers in the breath of women with breast cancer. And these results are fantastic. It shows again that this is something, a, a genuine mechanism where you can detect disease. But the key issue is all of the work that's done tends to be done with large instruments like this. This is called a mass spectrometer. We have a few of them in our lab. They cost about $400,000. Our investors don't like us buying them. Um, this isn't even really a solution for the hospital, let alone the home. And I think what this does is it highlights a fundamental dichotomy in chemical detection uh, and technology to date. On the one hand, you do have these high-end instruments. They're very complex, uh, very expensive, but they do the job. You need to be able to detect at those low concentrations. On the other hand, you have very simple sensors, which are cost-effective, but they simply don't meet the detection requirement that you need to make a useful diagnostic tool. So Alstone's technology aims to address this cost-usability performance metric. Uh, the technology we've developed is called field asymmetric mobility spectrometry. I'll buy a beer for anyone that remembers that by the end of the day. Uh, we just call it FAMES technology. So this is easier to remember, and I keep an eye out for it. Your challenge in detection is trying to pick the needle from the haystack. So what you're always trying to do is pick out the marker from the background. In a security application, this might be trying to detect sarin gas on a battlefield. In a medical application, it might be trying to detect a marker of disease, given you've just eaten a sandwich that has lots of garlic in it. So what our device is doing is filtering out the thing of interest from the background. So targeting in on that one chemical and then detecting it at the back. And just by changing the electric field properties that we apply within the device, we can tune it to allow different chemicals to pass through. And this allows us to build up a chemical fingerprint for different applications. So here you see just a, an example of a few chemical fingerprints. And what I'll show you in a second is the chemical fingerprint of different diseases. Now, again, the skeptic in me uh, means that you know, we can make claims about detection of disease. In reality, over the last two years or so, the only thing we're able to say is we can make a very sensitive and accurate uh, chemical analyzer. Uh, and we've tried to work with clinicians to see if they agree with the premise that you can detect these chemicals in a useful diagnostic context. Uh, and what's been fascinating here is that they know the specific clinical need in a way that we would never uh, see. And I think one of the big advantages for any technology company is to try and get it into the wild as early as possible to see what the actual feedback is from the users. So these range of uh, clinicians and academic partners have been taking an existing product that we have, and because you change what it detects in software, all we do is we just change the software, take the same box. And they've been able to run samples from hundreds of patients looking at breath, urine, and stool samples. 
So here's an example of uh, our instrument being used in breath analysis. So this is Russ, our head of chemistry. There's nothing wrong with him. He was very happy at the end of it when no red light started beeping. But here Russ is breathing out volatile chemicals. And as it goes into our instrument, what it's doing is building up this chemical fingerprint incredibly quickly in a matter of seconds. Urine is another thing that you can work with. So looking at the smell of urine and the chemicals that come out of urine is another way in which we can diagnose disease. And in this example, what we're doing is picking a preloaded detection method. Because in a doctor's office or wherever, you actually don't want to see spectra fingerprints, those types of things. You want yes, no answers. So here what we're doing is collecting the fingerprint at the end of it, turning that into actionable information. So a simple red light, green light that is generated incredibly quickly that allows doctors and clinicians to take some action. So what I want to do is just spend a few minutes looking at some of the things that they have found. Um, and I've kind of split it into treatment and diagnostics as well because how you use this uh, for adapting treatments is as important. Uh, this is the chemical fingerprint of a poo sample. Uh, if you go up to our lab in Cambridge at the moment, one of our chemists is running 6,000 uh, fecal samples uh, this week. What these particular researchers from the University of Warwick were trying to do was look at patients that have pelvic radiation disease. So if you were getting radiotherapy on a tumor down in the abdomen, the radiation uh, can cause a whole host of problems which leads to this uh, pelvic radiation disease. And the hypothesis was by uh, the inflammation changing the uh, bacteria that live in your gut, they start to make different compounds and they will smell differently. So the idea being that you can detect patients that have pelvic radiation disease. So this is the type of fingerprint that you get after some clever mathematics. What you end up with is a graph that looks a bit like this. So what you're looking at, each dot is a person. And what you can see here is that you can separate out these different groups. So patients that have pelvic radiation disease from patients that don't. Now what's much more interesting is by looking at a stool sample prior to undergoing treatment, they can predict which patients are going to develop, develop pelvic radiation disease. So here you're able to use the technology to figure out what is the best course of treatment given that this patient uh, might develop complications. We've been doing some fantastic work with the University of Amsterdam. They have a funded program called Ubiopred. Uh, here they're looking at asthma, particularly in children. Now, asthma is relatively easy to diagnose. Uh, here they're more interested in what are the types of treatments that we should use for asthma. Uh, there's a particular thing called eosinophilic inflammation that will uh, predict whether or not the child will respond to particular steroids for asthma. Uh, so what they were able to do was take these breath samples and analyze it on our machine to see if there was eosinophilic inflammation and predict steroid response. And before, what they were having to do was raise sputum samples, which is you know, very invasive, not very nice for children. So again, the overriding thing that we're trying to do here is provide information that helps doctors make treatment decisions, but doing it in a non-invasive and very quick way. Uh, we've literally just started this program. So this is using breath to screen for lung cancer. Uh, lung cancer is another big killer. 35,000 people in the UK die every year, and early detection gives you definitive improvement in outcomes. Uh, what we are doing is taking the identified markers of lung cancer, so classes of compounds called ketones and alkanes, that will predict lung cancer with 95% accuracy on the breath. But again, that was all done on those large machines that I talked about earlier. So we're kind of standing on the shoulders of giant machines and trying to take the markers that they've identified but put it into a package uh, in our system, which again is going to be something that is actually deployable that can actually make a difference. And the last example I have here is again from the uh, University of Warwick. So this is a researcher working with our platform here. You see he's working with urine samples and in the background he's got the chemical fingerprint on one of our machines. They ran a pilot trial of 47 patients, and uh, again, each dot represents a patient. And what they were able to do uh, was diagnose colon cancer from a urine sample. 
the results here are extremely encouraging, and we're extending this study. But the way in which they currently screen for colon cancer is a fecal occult blood test, so we're looking for uh, hidden blood and poo. Um, if you test positive for that, it's actually only a 10% chance that you have the disease. You then have to go and have a colonoscopy, which is about one of the most invasive procedures uh, that you could have. So here, we are quickly, non-invasively, screening for colon cancer uh, using a urine sample, and we think this will make a big difference. You know, when we look ahead to how the technology can be used, uh, I look at the system that we have now, and I think that could be used uh, in a hospital and clinical setting. And I think it's very important, actually, that we do work with clinicians in the start in order to validate and verify the technology. We already have handheld devices that we've built for our military business, so portable devices for soldiers. You can take the identified markers that have been discovered on the big machine and program it into the small machine. But we do want to go much further. Uh, the chip is already small. It's just a question of uh, engineering and money to miniaturize the electronics and the ancillary systems to go around that uh, in order to make a device which is truly portable that can be used in the hands of uh, people every day. So we think ahead and we think our technology and other sensor technologies will make a big impact on how healthcare happens in the future, where we can diagnose disease earlier, uh, where treatments have a bigger effect. So thank you very much. I would be happy to take any questions. It's very exciting, Billy. Um, how long do you think until we're carrying a smartphone or a smartphone-like device that we can just breathe into that will tell us what's wrong? So I, I don't think it's very far away. So the, the heavy lifting has been done with the core chip itself. So to reduce the electronics down one step further, I think can be done with 18 months to two years. Wow. Uh, and it's, you know, I, I think our approach is, you know, we do want to uh, work in a clinical setting to start with and make sure that the technology is ex accepted there. But there's certainly no barrier beyond investment that is required, hint, hint, uh, <laughs> that's, that's required to get down to a device that looks a bit like that. Amazing. So when we wrote a big piece about Alstone yep. and your story, my colleague Madhu, who's here, um, wrote a long feature which you can read on our website. Um, Kate was just at the early stages of her mm -hmm. treatment. How are things going since then? She's had more treatment. She's had more treatment. So the, the battle is long with cancers. I'm sure a lot of people in the room know. Well, I think everybody in the room is with Kate and with you. Thanks for making a difference. Thank you. Cheers.